This is the section on engine operation. Two. Hey, you got the engine started. Yay. The worst thing you can do to a jet engine is not over. What else do we need to do? Well, typically, in fact, pretty much all the time, when you get a jet engine started, you're going to turn the generator on so now you can have electrical power. You're going to double check. Hey, has the RPM stabilized? The EGT stabilized? The fuel flow stabilized? Oil pressure stabilized? Unlike a reciprocating engine that you're used to flying around with, the uh, jet engines, if you look at that RPM gauge and it's at idle, that needle is going to be steady. It's not going to wiggle up and down a little tiny bit. That EGT it's going to be pointing at a certain spot and it's not going to be wiggling up and down. The fuel flow gauge, it's going to be pointing at a particular spot and it's not going to be wiggling back and forth a little tiny bit. Stabilized is definitely a different kind of a word when it comes to jet engines, whereas the RPM in a piston engine, it might go up or might go down 50 RPMs. And you'd say, okay, no problem, and that's pretty typical with jets. It's like the needle isn't moving. You're like, hmm, if you can't hear the engine because it's away in the back of the airplane, all you have is the engine indicators, and they're not going to be moving. And, of course, you're going to want to look and see this oil pressure. You're definitely going to want it up within 30 seconds to start moving, whether or not it needs to be in the green arc within uh, 30 seconds or after by the time you get the engine at idle that's up to the particular engine please refer to the approved flight manual if you suspect that there might be icing you're going to turn it on we'll get to that chapter but if there's visible uh, visible visible h2o so that includes clouds fog mist uh snow rain ice falling out of the sky heat sleet hail and depending on the temperatures um might be five degrees fahrenheit to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It depends on the manufacturer, what they say is. You're going to turn the engine, of course this is, we're talking about engine, anti-ice on, because you don't want the ice to get stuck in the uh, intake of the engine, because you could get ice build up. And if then, after you turn it on, then you turn, after it forms, then you turn the ice on, the leading edge inside of the intake will get hot, heated and the ice will break off and of course the air is coming in here say at a couple hundred knots even at idle so it's going to could damage things so if there's a possibility of engine ice you're going to turn on the anti-ice right away um, typically the answer is no there is not a warm-up period for a jet engine in theory if you get the engine started and you've been towed out to the end of the runway as soon as you start the engines you can go to full power and it doesn't hurt anything you've already started it remember going from uh, 15 degrees Celsius you know up to a thousand degrees Celsius for the start and having it come back down and sit there at 800 degrees Celsius you've already heated up the inside of the engine you warmed it up that's one of the reasons why starting it is such a bad thing for it is that you're raising the temperature so fast well you've already done that so you don't have to warm anything up now I could caution you a warm-up period on the stuff that's bolted to the engine uh, I remember one time it was in the middle of the winter in Minot, North Dakota, and it was like minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit ambient, and we got the engines running and started turning on the generator and started turning on a whole bunch of components, and the generator fried because the something was wrong with the generator because it didn't warm up, but it wasn't an engine issue. Okay, you're getting ready for takeoff. If you're in a 172, you do, let's see, what do you do? You do a mag check. You check the vacuum, you mess with the mixture, make sure it's right, you look at how many amps you're putting out by the generator alternator, is the battery getting charged, um, let's see, there's probably something, if you have a constant speed prop, you're going to cycle the prop, um, you're going to have to check things, and typically you run these up at uh, higher than idle. in a recip but in a jet airplane we're already at 50 percent there's no magnetos you probably don't even have a vacuum pump but if you did the engine spinning around there's no mixture to set the generators are spinning fast enough you can check the amps coming off of them at any time you don't have to wait till engine run up 
and of course if you did were flying a turboprop you would cycle the propeller but for the as far as the engine is concerned the answer is no not typically you don't typically do a separate engine run up on jet engines and of course you're going to go into a chart you're going to enter with temperature and you're going to enter with uh, pressure altitude and wherever you get inside of that box that's going to be your takeoff power setting whether it's an EPR or an N1 slash fan RPM uh, if it's a turboprop you'll just run it up to redline and if it's a helicopter it'll tell you uh, you're also going to have to take this and, and take into account the weight of the helicopter to figure out how much power you're likely going to need if the flight manual for your aircraft says to turn the ignition on to the continuous setting that means it's spinning it's sparking a little slower than it would for starting then this would be a good time to take to turn that on in case there's a flame out and hopefully it'll catch the fuel on fire right away okay during takeoff you're gonna set the power obviously if it's a turbofan or a turbojet you're gonna set a speed or an EPR. If it's a turboprop or a turbo shaft engine, you're going to set torque. You're going to make sure you set it to that particular power. And then, of course, we all know we're going to check uh, fuel flow as a good secondary indicator. If it's a multi spool engine, we could add to this list. We might look at N2 and N3 to see if it's working correctly. Obviously, obviously, as you're advancing the power lever, you're going to want to keep an eye on the EGT and make sure it doesn't get too hot. And sure, take a pick, take a peek at the oil pressure, see what it's doing. But this is during. Now it's pretty typical that jets are really, really overpowered, and trying to hold them against their brakes doesn't work out. So you taxi onto the runway, and you can hold the brakes. And uh, let's just say you're setting fan speed, and we'll for for power in your turbo fan. And we've marked our uh, here's our bug for takeoff fan speed. When we get up to somewhere around, and this varies by airplane, about 80%, we go ahead and let go of the brakes. And we start to move, but we're going to finish getting the rest of this in here. It's only going to take 5 or 10 seconds to get the rest, and there's no sense holding the brakes. The airplane's not going to uh, accelerate appreciably different whether we let go at 80% or at 100 So then, during this takeoff roll, prior to... You know, V1 is decision speed, and the next speed is VR, which is rotate speed. Uh, during this time period in here, when we've got the airplane at at takeoff power, that's where we're going to check all of these things. So we're going to be busy in a 172. You know, you look at RPM, oil pressure, and you kind of go through, through, through. There's not that much to look at. In a jet, it's essentially you're kind of doing your... Uh, your engine run up during the takeoff. Okay, reduced thrust takeoffs. Let's say here your asphalt. And just, um, let's see. Let's say that a certain outside air temp and a certain pressure altitude and at a certain gross weight, it's going to take you a certain length of time to accelerate and then a certain distance to decelerate of course there's V1 decision speed so we come up on V1 we this is our calculations we're calculating uh, our acceleration plus deceleration distance based on outside air temperature the pressure altitude and the weight of the airplane of course you could also take into account whether or not the runway was sloped up or down if you're trying to take off a runway you know that has a 10 degree upslope that's kind of steep um, so you could take that into account runway slope but that's usually the smaller of these factors and you figure out that you've got uh, here just make it interesting you've got 2,000 feet left over and of course if you're part 91 you don't have to do the accelerate decelerate distance on the asphalt but just so you know part 91 operators typically do this and will not attempt to take off if their accelerate plus decelerate distance is longer than the amount of asphalt. But it's, 
you could if you wanted to. So let's say that we got 2,000 feet left over. Well, what we could do, this, this distance right here, this accelerate, decelerate distance, is based on, uh, is based on takeoff power, which another way to describe that would be 100% power. Not, not our red line, I mean not RPM, but 100% power. Well, what if we only ran that engine, let's say again, we're doing N1 fan on a turbo fan, and here's going to be 100%, and that's going to be takeoff power. What if instead of running it up to 100%, what if we ran it up to 98? What if we, whoops, what if we ran it at 98% power. What would happen then? Well, V1 is going to be the same speed. This is safe for grants that it's 105 knots indicated airspeed. But our acceleration distance is going to be a little bit farther. Now our deceleration distance is going to be the same because that's based on decelerating from 105 knots under the same conditions. But if we add that same distance on, whatever change here there was, whatever added to our acceleration distance, it's going to add to our decelerate, uh, accelerate and stop distance. So we can actually keep increasing this up to that 2,000 feet that we had left over. So you know what, we might even be able to go to 97 percent of takeoff power and then our acceleration distance and plus deceleration we still have, you know, a little tiny bit left over. As long as the accelerate decelerate doesn't go off the asphalt, we're going to be good. And you're going, well, Mr. Johnson, why would you want to do that? Now you don't have any runway left over. Well, that's true. That's true you don't, but you don't abort takeoffs very much. And here's why. Running this engine at less than takeoff power reduces how much money you have to spend when you overhaul the engine. And it might even reduce how often you have to overhaul the engine. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, so here's the factors, and I guess we could also add runway slope. If these are most of these in your favor, it's cold, the air, there's a lot of molecules per cubic inch, we don't weigh very much, the runway is really longer than we need, the runway slope is taken into account, who knows, maybe we're taking off down the runway. If we do that, then we can do a reduced thrust takeoff. And that's where we take off at less than takeoff power. And the reason is money. The second most wor the second worst thing you can do to a Jetta engine is to run it at takeoff power. You're blowing a lot of air through the engine, the velocities are high, the temperatures are high, the RPM is high. So although starting it's the worst thing you can do, uh, running it at takeoff power is definitely the second worst thing you can do. So if we can reduce it just a little tiny bit, how, much, how bad it is, by running it at just one or two or three or four or five percent less than takeoff power, then the engine's going to last longer and at the next overhaul it's going to cost less money. Less money at the overhaul. And it's not an insignificant amount. It's a huge amount of money. Who does this? 121, 135, and corporate uh, corporate operators. That So essentially anybody that's flying anything with a turbine engine in it. Uh, and how often do they do it? very often. In fact, a lot of operators, that is standard operating procedure, is if you figure out how much the accelerate and then decelerate distance is, and there's some left over, then you're going to calculate how much can I reduce the thrust. Now usually they'll probably only come up with one or two uh, different reduced thrust power settings, so you don't have to figure it out infinite number of times. But if there's a significant amount of runway left over at the end, you're going to calculate a reduced thrust takeoff. And if you can make it, that is the acceleration dis distance and the deceleration distance combined, so you still have runway left, and you're doing it at less than takeoff power, that's what you're going to do.
that is what you're going to do. So if it's uh, the airlines do it, and corporate jets, corporate turboprops do it as well. And they do it as often as they possibly can. Okay, you get off of the ground, you put the landing gear up, you start retracting some of the flaps. Here's an interesting thought. Every takeoff and landing in a jet is a short takeoff and landing. They're not really stall airplanes. Well, compared to how fast they cruise, they are. So every time you take off, you're going to be using some flaps. So as as you get off the run, when you start climbing, the first thing you do is when you get positive rate of climb, you're going to retract the landing gear, and then you're going to get rid of some flaps, accelerate, go faster, get rid of a little more flaps. You may actually take two or three times to get rid of the flaps. It depends on the airplane and the speed schedule. And this whole time in here, you're accelerating. Now that's probably kind of weird because in a 172 you might rotate at 70 knots and you accelerate to 80 knots or whatever VY is and you've done all of your acceleration within 5 or 10 seconds of getting off of the ground. But in a jet, you are still accelerating in the climb you are still accelerating in the climb and you need to so you can get enough lift off of the wings so that you don't have to have any flaps so after you get off the ground you're gonna you're gonna retract the gear and somewhere in getting rid of the flaps or maybe right after the last flaps you're gonna go to climb power now this whole time right here has to be less whoops has to be less than five minutes because takeoff power is uh, limited typically to five minutes and usually this time usually this time in here is only about two minutes and actually most of it's after you get off the ground if you had the ignition to continuous now at some point above the ground you could turn the ignition from continuous setting to off uh, as you climb up Let's say here's our throttle quadrant, and we'll say here's idle. And you push the throttle up, the power lever up, to take off power. As you climb up in altitude, if you're sea level, you're, really, it doesn't matter. You're, you're, and this is uh, all altitude effects. Oops. <laughs> your thrust is going to get less. So let's say here's takeoff power and let's say here's climb. Well if you started right here, well of course this altitude is how high you can still maintain climb altitude, but if you set climb and you're still climbing in altitude, your thrust is going to get less. So as you go up a little bit, if it's not a computer controlled engine, you're going to have to push the power lever back up. The thrust will have come down and you'll go back up. As you climb, it'll go down and then you push the throttle back up. As you climb, it'll go down and you push the throttle back up. So as you're climbing, you're going to be pushing the power lever forward. That's essentially telling the fuel control, burn more fuel. Well, if we're trying to maintain, let's say, a climb EPR, you know, say of 1.8 or something, and we're looking at fuel flow, and we're looking at exhaust gas temperature. As we're going up higher in altitude, there's less and less air. So for if, but we're putting in more fuel. So we're going to have to spend more energy compressing air to get the same amount of thrust. So a greater percentage of our fuel is going to be used to compress air. So fuel flow is going to go up. And if we just maintain the same amount of air going through the engine, higher fuel flow, same amount of air, EGT is going to be rising. So the climb power will come back down and then we push it back up. So what's going to end up happening is we're going to have a trend where the EGT is going to be rising and the fuel flow is going to be rising just to try to maintain our climb power setting. So at some point, and granted it's mostly in older engines, like if you're flying a 727, you may get up to a certain altitude where you hit the EGT, and now you can't push the throttle forward anymore. In fact, if you keep climbing, 
if you keep going to a higher altitude, it's possible that if you leave the throttle right where it is, let's say you leave it, you leave it right here, it's possible that as you keep climbing, since you're maintaining fuel flow, your may, fuel flow may stay constant, but there's less air coming into the engine if you're still climbing. The EGT could actually go past redline even though you haven't pushed the throttle or the power lever any farther. So the higher you get, keep a closer eye on the exhaust gas temperature and make sure that you don't hit the EGT during a climb. After you get to altitude, you're going to set the power setting for a particular Mach number. If you're uh, flying across the uh, the Atlantic, see here's the British Isles and Iceland up there and them other countries and stuff, and you're flying across the North Atlantic, they're going to put one airplane out there every 10 minutes. If you looked at it from the side, here would be flight level 360, flight level 350, 340, and they're going to stack airplanes up one on top of the other, but this one and this one and this one, this gap here is going to be 10 minutes. This gap between this airplane and this airplane is going to be 10 minutes. And there might be an airplane here, and 10 minutes later there's an airplane here, 10 minutes later there's an airplane here. This is the side view. And this gap right here is going to be a minimum of 10 minutes. And there's no radar out here. There's no ships out here with radar. So the only way air traffic control has to keep you from hitting other airplanes is by you flying a constant Mach. So when you take AS350, uh, International and Domestic, Domestic and International Navigation, you'll find when you're flying over the oceans on the tracks, they're going to put you about 10 minutes behind the plane in front of you, and they're going to tell you what Mach to fly. Typically, it's somewhere close to Mach 0.80, and then that way everybody maintains their separation. Of course, you may, if you're out here by yourself or obviously flying around the United States or wherever you're flying, you may fuel flow may be the issue. You may want to fly the farthest distance for the least amount of fuel, so you're going to set it to be fuel efficient. Or you might decide, you know what, I'm a little bit behind. I don't want the FAA to report my airline as be having a late uh, arrivals, so you're going to fly as fast as you can get away with. You're going to push it up to the red line mock for the airplane. Uh, you'll burn more fuel, but uh, your airline is going to have a standard operating procedure. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. Do you want to go fast? Do you want to keep from hitting other people? Do you want to burn the least amount of fuel? If you're in flight and the engine flames out, you may read in the book, let's say you're cruising around at 36,000 feet, and since the engine is typically gets started at sea level to 10,000 feet, they're going to design the combustion chamber and the starting system to work really well between sea level and 10,000 feet, maybe sea level 15,000 feet. But if you're at 36,000 feet and the engine slows down, it may not be pumping enough air into the engine to make it work correctly during engine start. And so you may have to descend. You may be flying along, and you may have to descend down, say, to 25,000 feet. It may say in the in the approved flight manual that you have to be lower than 25,000 feet so there's enough air to get the engine started. The other thought is, if you have an airplane with a pneumatic starter, if the engine flames out, it's still going to windmill. It's still going to be spinning around. If you look inside the intake of that engine, it's going to be rotating just from the forward speed of the engine. Um, you can't re-engage the starter motor if the engine is running, so you don't get to use the starter for this in-flight restart if you have a pneumatic starter. So in that case, you're going to have to fly a certain speed. They'll give you a certain indicated airspeed. It may be uh, 200 knots indicated. And so while, during this descent, of course, you're going to want to make sure you're at least 200 knots indicated airspeed, which is probably not going to be a problem. So there's going to be this maximum altitude you're going to have to descend below, and this minimum airspeed that you're going to have to fly faster than in order to get a proper in-flight relight. Okay, you're coming into land. Let's take a peek at this. you got to understand that jet airplanes are only fuel efficient at high altitudes because at high altitude we have such less drag. We can go a lot faster 
where we can go the same speed with a whole lot less drag. If we're at altitude, we might be able to do 250 knots uh, equivalent airspeed at 42,000 feet. That's that 250 knots equivalent uh, airspeed is going to be 500 knots true airspeed, but the drag is directly related to the equivalent airspeed. So we can cut our drag dramatically, essentially in half, if we go up higher. So we're going to want to get up high as fast as we can and then stay up there as long as we can. If we're going to take off, we want to climb reasonably fast and then when we descend, we want to descend as late as possible and we're going to descend at flight idle. And you're going, why flight idle? Why don't we start out here and say cruise around at 70% power and just for fun we'll say that this is 80% power and let's just start our descent earlier. Well you gotta understand if you look at that engine and 90 to 95% RPM that's gonna be cruise power and we'll just say that's about 80% power Whoops. If we pull the RPMs down to where we're producing 70% power, then the engine's not efficient. The engine is only efficient, really efficient, over a very small range of RPMs. Anytime we operate outside of that, then it's not going to be as efficient. If we pull the power lever back and we're only producing, uh, you know, we pull it back to like 82% RPM and that gives us like 70% power, Yes, we could start descending sooner, but now we have a longer time. Now we have a longer time here that the engine is operating at an inefficient or an inefficient power setting. So, air traffic control issues aside, we would want to wait to the last possible moment, pull the throttle back to flight idle, so that we could descend very rapidly, so we could have our greatest time at cruise at possi as possible. And so why do we want to have flight idle descents? Is so we can stay at this fuel efficient altitude, thus drag, as long as possible, and we can run the engine at a fuel efficient power setting as long as possible. Shock cooling. If you look at the RPM versus fuel flow, on a jet engine and I'll say here's a hundred percent and we pull the power back fuel flow is going to go back so if RPM goes down then fuel flow goes down it's not a one-to-one -one ratio but certainly it's pretty decent in that whenever we uh, reduce cooling you know cooling is due to the is due to the compressor pushing that seventy percent cooling air through the uh, combustion chamber. If we reduce the cooling air, we also have a corresponding, not exact, but we do have a reasonably co reasonable correlation to reduction in fuel flow, which means we have a reasonable re relationship to a reduction in heat. If we push the power lever back up, we get more RPMs, we burn more fuel, so if we have an increase in temperature or an increase in heat, then we also get an increase in cooling. In reciprocating engines with uh, fins, we may be adding RPM, but cooling and adding fuel, but cooling uh, is dependent upon the forward speed of the airplane. So we might pull the nose up and climb up fast and have high fuel flow and have high heat, but cooling might actually go down. So flying around in a 172, there's not this wonderful correlation all the time between cooling and heat. So if we have a piston airplane with uh, cooling fins, we could have shock cooling, but on jet engines, you're not going to be able to shock cool a jet engine at all. Anti-ice. Here's an interesting thought. We'll get to it when we get to the chapter. But the most likely time, if here's sea level, and here's 40,000 feet, the most likely place for icing is in here. That's one nice thing about jets is that they can get above most of the place. It might be cold up here, but it's so cold that the ice is already ice and it's not going to stick to the airplane. So climbing out through, uh, this is a good time to have icing and descending down through it 
is a good time to have icing. Uh, so what you may pay atten- want to pay attention to is during that descent, do I need to turn my engine ice on because you want it to uh, prevent the ice from forming. You don't want to wait till it forms. You want to turn it on, turn on the anti-ice system before it forms. Also, some airplanes will suggest or recommend or tell you to turn on the ignition to continuous sometime during the approach in case you have an accidental flame out, which is pretty unlikely. Um, approach power. Let's say you're coming into land and you're in this airplane that get, you know, it's doing 250 knots indicated airspeed at altitude, indicated airspeed or equivalent airspeed. And that's enough lift. Well, now all of a sudden, we want to slow down to 150 knots indicated airspeed. Our lift is going to be a whole lot worse. So we're going to have to do a couple of things. We're going to have to fly this wing at a higher angle of attack to get more lift. So, so one, we're going to have to have a higher angle of attack. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a lot of flaps. Lots of flaps so we can get a lot of sp- uh, lift at slow speed. Well guess what both of these things do? They cause more drag, not just the added lift, but they cause more drag. So guess what we're going to have to counteract during approach? We're going to have to counteract the drag. So our power setting is going to be higher than it would be if we were in a reciprocating engine powered airplane where we're, it's, you know, we're going from 110 knots cruise and let's say we approach at 80 we only have a 40 knot change from 70 to 110 now we're gonna have a 100 knot change so we're gonna have to make up for that lack of lift from lower speeds by having higher angles of attack uh, by using more better flaps more flaps but both of them are gonna cause drag so we're gonna have to use a lot more power during the approach than we would if we were flying a reciprocating engine. Of course when we touch down if we have thrust reversers we can use them if we have a reverse pitch propeller we can use that and we've already covered be careful don't exceed any red lines in particular the EGT. Okay you finally uh, gotten off the taxiway run your checklist you're ready to shut down the engine. Uh, Some engines, not all, some engines need a cool down period. That's so all of the engine parts can get close to the same temperature, um, especially if you went to a high power setting during reverse thrust. Uh, typically, just like in a recip, if you only have to cool it down for a few minutes, you, that gets accomplished during taxi, so you typically don't have to wait um, after you park before you shut it down. Uh, with some engines will ask you, will, some engines you'll need to run it a little bit above idle, I know one particular engine, a J60 or a JT12, that was on a T39 or a, or a Rockwell Saberliner, and on uh, the original Jet Stars, where you actually ran it up about 10 or 15 percent above idle to scavenge the oil out of the engine, so that when you shut it down, there wouldn't be a bunch of oil in the engine. So you're going to want to read in the approved flight manual what are the shutdown things I need to take into account. After you turn off the fuel, it's really easy to shut the engine off. You just turn off the fuel. It's uh, possible some engines make certain noises. And f- for instance, if you've ever gone to an air show, a C5 Galaxy, it's got a TF-39 engine in it, I believe. And at the hub where the blades are attached, um, not drawing blades very well, the connection right here, lets the blades flop around just a little tiny bit. Of course, centrifugal force will pull the blade into the exact position it needs to be in. But as this comes around, this blade right here will clink down and touch the next one. Uh, so the airplane, the engine actually makes clinking noises uh, as the air is spinning. In fact, I've seen at air shows you walk up to a C5 Galaxy and the wind's windmilling the engine at, you know, at five revolutions per minute or something. And you can hear it going clink, 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 clink. And that J60 in that uh, Saber Liner or that Jetstar, it also made that kind of noise. So you might want to ask somebody, hey, is this the normal noise that you hear out of this engine when it's shutting down? And of course, we all know that the most accurate time for you to check the oil level on a jet engine is right after you've shut it down. 
that's going to be the most accurate because all the oil is has been scavenged from inside of the engine and pumped into the reservoir so now you can pull the dipstick out and you'll know exactly where uh, the oil is, what level it is, that would be equivalent to when the engine was running so you won't accidentally overfill it. Engine power settings, of course, the highest power setting that you can legally use during a non-emergency is takeoff power. It's also called rated power. If you're flying a, a, a jet in the military, they call it military power, and that's lower than afterburner. And, of course, that's typically five minutes is as long as you can run it. Uh, there are some engines that have other power settings. A, a typical one would be a 30-minute power setting. That's typically for helicopters because they have to hover and hover takes a lot of power, maybe not quite takeoff power but pretty close and of course these restrictions are so you don't uh, force the engine to get overhauled too soon or when you do have to overhaul it you don't have to spend as much money. The next highest power setting would be maximum continuous or sometimes abbreviated and you can certainly do that on the test MOX space CONT maximum continuous when do you use it? When one of the engines fails or quits working, then you're going to run all the good engines up to maximum continuous. Uh, jet engines are really overpowered, so you don't have to go to take off power if an engine quits. Now, obviously, if you're in the airplane and you got an engine on each wing and one engine stops working, oh, say it smoked. I hate that when that happens. Oh, I suppose we need a vertical stabilizer. And there you are. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so you're flying along and one engine fails, so it's not working. And so, of course, you push the power lever up on the good engine to max continuous. If you're still descending and you're on max continuous, it's okay to go to take off power. Hopefully, you know, oh, oh nah, darn, I'm still descending. You know, if you can't get to an airport, then you know the FIRs say you can violate the FIRs if you're going to have if you're having an emergency if you're going to die so you could actually go above takeoff power if you needed to so you could maintain flight to get to the next airport or maybe climb above the next mountain if you're flying in Peru or something uh, but typically the vast majority of the time you only have to go to maximum continuous power during engine failure because even with an engine out you're still you still have plenty of power uh, the next highest power setting would be climb power setting. We've already talked about that. LRC stands for long range cruise. The definition of long range cruise is the greatest miles, uh, well, let's use greatest distance for the least fuel. Long range cruise will give you the greatest distance for the least fuel. In a 172, we'd call that economy cruise, but we're going to fly jets now, so we don't use those piston powered airplane abbreviations anymore. Long range cruise is going to give you the greatest distance for the least amount of fuel. Maximum endurance, the definition of endurance, is the greatest time for the least fuel and typically when you do that is if somebody tells you to go into a holding pattern and it's not uncommon on big old honking jet airplanes to actually put in a small amount of flaps when you go into holding it's not a thing right now in a Cessna 172 but there's actually max holding speeds and so you're going to need to slow down, which works out just fine, because if you want to stay up for the least amount of time, it's not about going very far. It's not about it's not about going very fast. It's just about staying up there for the least amount of time. So this is going to be an even lower power setting than maximum endurance, because now you're just trying to burn the least amount of fuel to just barely stay up in the air. Okay, D-rated and flat-rated. I'm going to talk about that. Let's say you have a Beach 1900. And let's say you have another Beach 1900. And the first model came out 
with two Pratt & Whitney PT6s rated at a thousand uh, now let's rate them at 800 shaft horsepower equivalent and you design uh, a max gross takeoff weight and you have certain distances for takeoff uh, based on temperature and pressure altitude and this plane works great this Beach 1900 works great well years later uh, it, the, air, the engine comes in for an overhaul and Beechcraft and the engine manufacturer that makes PT6s have come up with a deal and they said you know what if you take out this old PT6 that has 800 equivalent shaft horsepower let's say that's that's a, an A-1 and you put in a PT6 uh, A-2 and it puts out a thousand equivalent shaft horsepower wow you could have a higher gross takeoff weight you could take off when it's hotter you could have worse pressure altitudes or use that torque meter that's at 800 equivalent shaft horsepower on this airplane you leave the red line at 800 equivalent shaft horsepower you still get the exact same performance on this airplane except when you're at higher temperatures or higher pressure altitudes remember as you climb up in altitude all altitude effects this goes down of course it goes down worse at 36,000 feet but thrust including equivalent shaft horsepower gets less as you climb well guess what if you start it out at 800 it's going to go down so at a certain pressure altitude with temperature you're going to get less thrust but if you start it out at a lot and you were coming down you could actually go to a higher altitude before you'd get that reduction in thrust so one of the advantages of derating the engine it's really can produce a thousand equivalent shaft horsepower but you have derated it and the same word for that is flat rated it means the same thing flat rated and derated means that the engine could really produce more power but we're artificially reducing the red line power setting so that it doesn't so several it does several things the advantages here are we can we can uh, take off. Let's see, it doesn't have that on there. Okay, so one, we can have higher altitude takeoffs. We can have higher temperature takeoffs and still produce our 800 equivalent shaft horsepower. Uh, if it'll produce more horsepower at sea level, then we can go to higher altitudes before we'll run out of power. So we can go to higher altitudes for crews. If we can go to higher altitudes for crews, there'll be a bigger gap between our knots equivalent airspeed versus our knots true airspeed. So we'll actually be able to get a higher true airspeed because we're up there where there's less drag. So we can have a higher true airspeed because we can go to a higher altitude. If the engine can really withstand a thousand shaft horse or equivalent shaft horsepower, but we're only asking 800 equivalent shaft horsepower, we're going to save money. It's going to cost less money at overhaul. So it saves us money on maintenance. And then my personal favorite is in case of an emergency, we've got that torque meter. It's sitting there at eight, eight, the red lines at 800 equivalent shaft horsepower, but we know it'll put out. 1,000 equivalent shaft horsepower. If one of the engine quits, torque goes down to zero, we not only have 800 shaft horsepower, and if in an emergency we could get more out of it, because you know if we're near sea level we can always put out more than the takeoff, but the engine will really put out 1,000, so guess what? We could really get maybe 1,100 or 1,200 shaft horsepower out of it. So in case of an emergency, 
we're going to have way more extra power than we would if we had a normally rated engine. So derating or flat rating engines, which is the same thing, have many, many, whoops, I guess number six. We'd have more power in emergencies. Wow, there's a lot of good reasons to derate or flat rate an engine. It's not uncommon to derate or flat rate an engine. The term temperature limited, I uh, talked about that earlier. Let's say you're climbing and you're maintaining climb power. Let's say you're doing it on an EPR. And if this is EGT, and here's your red line, then as you climb up and you're pushing the throttle farther forward, as you climb up to air that has less molecules per cubic inch, you're actually increasing the fuel flow, but you're not increasing how much air goes through the engine. So you have a ratio of less cooling air for the same amount of fuel, uh, for of heat. So the EGT is going to rise. You may get this temperature limit on takeoff. Or your, climb, uh, your cruise altitude. So you may not be able to get to the altitude you want. You may take off and climb, and you might, might want to get up to here, but at this point right here, your EGT is coming up on red line, you're going to have to level off. Or you may be on takeoff, and you're at the end of the runway, and you're pushing your power lever forward towards takeoff power, and you're at such a high altitude. Typically, the temperature limited is because of high pressure altitudes and high outside air temperatures. Those are the things that contribute to temperature limited takeoffs is you're coming up on takeoff power and before you get there the EGT comes up on red line and you have to stop. Now the good thing is there'll be charts for you to find this out in advance but of course it's always a good idea to keep your eye on the EGT gauge as you're advancing the power lever for takeoff. And of course regardless of what anything Mr. Johnson says follow the manufacturer's approved checklists. If you have any questions about engine operation section 2, please get a hold of me and if you have any suggestions on how to do it better, please let me know. Thank you.